Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming along to the Homelessness Prevention and Social Housing Subcommittee. Uh, we Do we have any apologies for absence? I think we're all present, apart from Dan Maycock, who uh, said he would be here shortly. He's happy for us to continue with that. Yeah, Councillor Paul Turner and Councillor Thomas J. Yeah, and uh, we've got a substitute. So thank you, Councillor Doyle, for substituting, and Councillor Maycock is a substitute as well. Okay, we move on to minutes of the previous meeting. Is it your wish that it, they have a quick record? Any comments? I'm happy to move those minutes. No, I think this is your first it's meeting. My first, yeah, my first meeting. Well, I'd like to welcome you, okay. Councillor Cook, to your first meeting. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And thank you for joining us with your, uh, your experience in housing. So we welcome you, but I'm happy to confirm those minutes. Yeah, good. Okay. Item number three, declarations of interest. Has anyone got anything to declare? No. We'll take that as a no. And we'll move on to item four, which is uh, the Council Housing Social Housing Regulation Bill and Preparedness. And we're going to receive a report from the uh, Assistant Director, Neighbourhoods. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good evening, members of the committee and colleagues. Um, as the Chair said, tonight's presentation is going to focus around social housing regulation and our preparedness for it across our council housing service. Um, just to say before we sort of run through the presentation, the details of this will be available as an annex as part of the Cabinet report on this item that's set to go on the um, 10th of November. Um, so it will be available um, for you at that at that point, um, but there are there are some hard copies around if people either can't see the screen or need access to that. Um, so this is about just a recap in terms of what we've already been talking to committee about, um, and especially for the new members, um, it's probably useful to do this. But it is about continuing that conversation because since last year. Um, we have been talking about the social housing regulation legislation that's proposed and how that's going to impact on council housing um, and the council's own stock. So just in, by way of a bit of a recap, this slide just draws your attention to the social housing white paper, um, which started with the charter for social housing residents that was updated last year, um, and which talked about key themes really that tenants and leaseholders should come to expect in terms of how services are delivered. And they covered things like safety, quality of the, of the housing service, being transparent, um, having neighbourhoods that focus on place and are clean and well managed, ensuring tenant engagement and that we understand our tenant base and that our tenancy management um, is of a high quality. So um, there are links in the presentation to the detailed charter that was presented by the regulator and by um, the government um, and that's probably an elementary update but that is the, the key headlines around that. Um, so in terms of preparing for that, we commissioned a self-assessment um, to look at how we um, already meet those consumer and economic standards. Um, and I think you'll recall some of you who, who were involved at that particular time that we had presentations from Savills, external providers who started to talk to us about um, as a service what we should be doing to meet those standards and there's been a range of presentations obviously for the new members you won't have seen these but back in November there was an update we did it again in February and there was an update on the 15th of June to this committee so uh, every opportunity it's been a, um, a mainstream agenda item um, so we can sort of uh, explain progress. So those self-assessment uh, preparations were well underway as planned. Um, just a bit of a reminder, and it is in the presentation and in the pack if you want to take one away with you, but what the government are proposing is a grading approach um, to regulation. So we'll move away um, from a more local approach to uh, inspection to a more proactive approach. Uh, in, in, uh, inspection regime by the regulator and when they come to assess our services it will cover four consumer standards so home standard which is all about repairs and health and safety the tenancy standard which is all about how we let our homes 
um, the tenant involvement and empowerment standard, which is how tenants are involved in the decision making and scrutiny of services, and neighbourhood and community, which is all about our environmental services offer, if you like. And they will rate each one of those um, consumer standards based on our compliance or non-compliance and whether we, there are gaps in our provision. So that has been the assessment that has been undertaken by an external company called Scrutiny and Empowerment who have looked at our current provision and given us an indicative rating across each of those areas. Um, and the social housing regulation bill I'll come on to in a bit minute uh, in a minute in terms of where it is in the parliamentary process. Um, but already the regulator has said that from next April we'll be required to uh, publish what are, what are going to be known as tenant satisfaction measures. Um, and there will be 22 of these. There was consultation that was done earlier on in this year, which we referred to the last committee. Um, and there'll be a requirement that not only will we seek tenants' um, opinions about those questions, because it'll be things like how satisfied are you with your landlord, how satisfied are you with your repairs. I mean, interestingly, out of the 22 tenant sat satisfaction measures, 10 relate to repairs. Um, so there's not only a requirement to publish it, there's a requirement to collate it in the right way so that it can be um, benchmarked with other providers. Um, and from April next year, the regulator has, has issued a direction that we will be required to publish that. And the regulator and the government have made it clear that they will, and this is their words, name and shame landlords who are not performing well. And it's all part of raising that bar in terms of what our uh, tenants can expect. Um, so there will be resourcing implications around that. We collect, of those 22 proposed tenant satisfaction measures, we collect some of it but not all of it. So when we go to Cabinet in um, November, we will be recommending that there's some resources uh, made available so we can start to collect that data and then we are ready to publish it. Um, so that's a bit about where we've moved on from, from when we last met. Um, so what I want to do tonight and I appreciate that it's a discussion um, and that the details of that discussion will inform the report that we then take to Cabinet in November. But I do want to cover some key points. One is around the Social Housing Regulation Bill and when we can expect that. Um, the next is around the rent cap. Um, some of you may be aware that the government launched a consultation at the end of August on proposing a rent cap uh, for tenants. Um, and we have today responded to that with the portfolio holders agreement. Um, so I'll talk to you a bit about what that means because that will have an impact on our financial capacity to deliver our capital programmes if it goes ahead, as well as on our management capacity, um, given the numbers that I'm going to talk about shortly. Then I'm going to talk to you a bit about the self-assessment um, in terms of what the consultants' findings were and where we are in terms of what we're delivering. Then I want to take the opportunity, you will have noticed that we've got two representatives from our tenant consultative group in the room today. Um, Iris and Sally are the chair and vice chair of our tenant consultative group. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that in a bit, what that means. Um, but certainly going to the heart of the agenda around putting tenants at the centre of what we do, it was only right that they observe tonight the committee, but then through our constitutional processes we look to um, give them a more formal footing on this committee. So we'll talk a bit about that. And then I just want to share with you what the emerging draft cabinet recommendations are looking like for November. So if there is any discussion, we can capture that as part of that process. Um, so in terms of the social housing regulation bill then, so I've mentioned already what the themes were in terms of what it's trying to achieve. It's about um, putting tenants at the heart of that decision making, it's about driving up property standards and it's about creating an inspection framework that's more proactive rather than passive as it has been to date. Um, as you can see it's making its way through the parliamentary processes, it's still, at com it's still at committee stages so we're not expecting it to receive royal assent or be in, on the statute books until um, probably next year but it could happen at any time and obviously we're keeping a close eye on that um, but essentially it will remove what we call the serious detriment test so where in the past regulators have only gone into those organisations where they appear to be failing we will now be more on an inspection 
time uh, 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 inspection timetable, that will mean that we'll be inspected at least every four years. Where we are on that um, timetable will be dependent on risk, and the regulator will assess that based on findings from things like the ombudsman, the building um, the building regulator, etc. So it will be risk-based, so we're not anticipating being first, um, but equally we do need to be prepared for that. There will also be stronger enforcement powers for the regulator, so I've mentioned naming and shaming. They're also talking about unlimited fines where there's non-performance, and they're also talking about management intervention through performance improvement plans if, there's, if things aren't. Um, delivered as as we say they should be. Um, there's also a requirement around what they call professional standardisation. So the view is you should expect and our tenants should expect that senior managers are qualified and well trained and we're, and we're able to understand and apply um, that legislation appropriately. And then as I've mentioned earlier it's about improving property standards. So there's already been a consultation in the private sector around what they're calling Decent Homes Plus or decent homes too, depending on who you speak to. But there's also there's, there's the view that it will move beyond what is just a basic standard around modern kitchen and bathroom facilities, for example, um, to focus much more around carbon neutrality and some of those measures, which again, you know, is a good thing. Um, so then moving on to the rent cap, so the reason we've put this in the presentation um, is because obviously this will have those uh, implications for the HRA business plan um, and that will impact on our preparations for self-assessment because how much we can invest in our stock and how much we can deliver on a service is dependent upon the income levels that we um, you know, can maximise as a councillor and as a service. So we've sent the response in today. Um, again, that will be the full response will be appended to the cabinet report in November. Um, but for those of you who don't know, the government um, are well, they are recommending a five percent cap on rent charges from April next year. But the consultation was around whether organisations would prefer a three, five, or seven percent cap. Now, on the basis, our HRA business plan assumes that we would put rents up by CPI plus 1%, and CPI, as at July, was 10.2%. We assumed rents would be going up by 11.2%. So, for us, a 5% cap would mean that over 30 years, there's 42 million less in the business plan. And over five years, and again, these figures are available for you, there would be just under 7 million losses from within the business plan and the points that we've made is our social rents are around 40 percent less than market rents we've got around 60 percent of our tenants are on housing benefit so for those cohorts they would not be impacted by that rent cap because benefits would just be adjusted accordingly so the the the, the um I suppose the conundrum which it's been referred to is, you know, we recognise that we need to balance people's affordability. And when you look at that, what that means in real terms is if the average rent is £100 a week for ease of calculation, ours is a bit less, you know, that would mean under CPI it going up by around what, 11 12 pounds a week the cap would mean only five pounds so you're talking about still an increase but probably six or seven pound less um, under the cap but what that means is you know that seven just under seven million over the next five years less we've got to spend puts at risk the capital investment that we've got planned which is 46 and a half million over the next five years so what the uh, response does to the government is ask some questions because at the moment um, under the rent standard we're required to set rents in accordance with local market conditions and this appears to be a one size fits all um, and it, it doesn't appear to reconcile with the government's levelling up agenda. So we have asked that if they do go ahead with the cap um, then the housing revenue account is compensated for what we've had in terms of four years of rent reductions and now the potential um, to have a cap. But what the, the council's executive director of finance and I attended a roundtable meeting with the government last 
week and they said they would let us know by the end of the calendar year. So the next step on that will be to determine what our response is and, and I would expect we'll be coming back to this committee with some of those choices. Um, but clearly it's, it's significant in terms of our prepa preparedness for the self-assessment because that will impact on achieving some of those government ambitions. Um, in terms of our preparedness then, so the self-assessment was carried out between February and August as we talked about at the last committee meetings for those of you who were here um, and um, we've had a really positive uh, response from the um, external consultants who have looked at this for us. As always, they have identified an improvement plan, a draft improvement plan, where there's some significant actions for us to undertake. Um, and, you know, we don't underestimate the scale of that task. But the strengths, if you like, were, um, and this was the external feedback, so these were their words, not, not ours, is that there was a strong and committed cabinet and leadership team. The consultants met with cabinet, they met with partners, they met with a range of stakeholders, and they said the level of enthusiasm um, was, you know, was really good. Um, they also said we we're one of the first to undertake a self-assessment around the new proposed standards, um, and that puts us in a significantly better place um, because we know where our priorities are. There was nothing in there that says that we're of serious detriment, so there'll be no self-reporting. Some of you will have seen in the press that some councils have had to self-report because they've been non-compliant. We're not in that position. There are areas where there are actions required to maintain compliance, and I'll come on to that in a minute, but there is nothing that's of serious detriment. Equally important, there's nothing that we didn't know. We could have written it ourselves, you know, because we are very self-aware and, you know, we listen to you all the time. So that was also important. We weren't sitting there trying to defend the indefensible. We accepted the findings. Um, and we now have a risk-based improvement plan that's been traffic lighted about, about um, based on what we should be doing first. And there is clear compliance on our tenancy and home standards. Yes, there's a few actions, but it was overwhelmingly compliant, which when you think the home standard is where our repairs and health and safety is, those are the areas where, you know, the, the present the, the most risk. Those are the areas which we are doing better at. The weaknesses, however, there was uh, a C3 or 4 rating for our tenant involvement and community standards, and that was because it was recognised, and, and it was our own cabinet who pointed this out, that they wanted to see more tenant involvement through those democratic processes. And so there was a realisation that, you know, developing our tenant involvement strategy was key. They also said some of our service standards across those areas were inconsistent. For example, we need to do more work on our... Uh, neighbourhood service standards around street scene and, and caretaking, etc. Um, and we also need to link, they said, the new tenant satisfaction measures to the council's wider performance culture around key performance indicators. Because again, we've got a live dashboard on our intranet that points to some of our key performance indicators, which our tenants regularly re review. But what they said is that they needs refreshing. And also, we need to update our satisfaction survey because we've not surveyed our tenants as a whole since 2018 and that's due in part because of the disruptions through covid that's the explanation um, but the external assessment said you know that explanation won't get you very far if they're coming in a couple of years you will have expected to have moved on from that the opportunities they pointed to were we've got um, real strength with our partners real resilience in our communities and they said we are very lucky and we recognise that. They pointed to things through the heart of Tamworth, through um, the a Sacred Heart, through the Manor House, through our TAC. All of those things, they said that puts you in a significantly better position than some of your peers. And the fact that you've got those strong links are worthy of further development, which is always nice to know and pass on. Um, they also, obviously, the opportunities were... were the compliance on our home and tenancy standards, they said you just need to mirror what you do there in your other areas. Um, so that was also a good opportunity. Said we've got a strong commitment to digitalisation. Um, you know, we recognise that where there's low value, high volume tasks, we want to try and reduce that waste demand by digitalising that so we can focus on the real vulnerability and that face-to-face -face offer where we need to. And they said 
which is why we want to put a lot of work into um, supporting you around the housing and homelessness subcommittee is a real opportunity and they said if you can link your tenants to that and there is that cl cross collaboration of working then that will be an area of best practice so again that's worth passing on the threats obviously to it is the rent cap and the our ability to invest you know we we know that we're always uh, scaled back by money and time don't we so we we recognize that um, we also know that rising income will be unpopular from the rent cap. The uh, financial experts who have been looking at that for us have simply said, and it's easier said than done, you know, you need to raise your income and reduce your expenditure. Well, that is hard work and that is not an easy conversation. Um, they also said that some of the difficulties are, um, and this isn't through the want of trying, but representation from hard to reach groups is difficult. Um, and I'm, certainly our TCG colleagues will tell you we've tried to do that, but I think we need to look at different ways of engaging people, um, you know, whether that be one of our, you know, under our equality duties or, or otherwise. Um, it is resource intensive. The action plan we've got, if I tell you um, that there's probably 100 lines and different tasks, so it is resource intensive. It will need some policy refresh around that. So we expect to be going to Cabinet with a resourcing plan around how we try and achieve that. And if we're not able to resource that, then that also uh, impacts on our ambition. And the other threat is we need to be ready for inspection. I think what they said was everybody they spoke to was really open, transparent, you know, was just you know, oozing enthusiasm to tell you what was happening. But they said that needs to be scripted. You know, because sometimes we can be in danger of showing compliance, but the more you talk, the more they ask questions, and sometimes that could move you into non-compliance. So they said being inspection ready is a skill, um, and we took that on board. So in terms of that self-assessment, we're in a good place, and um, our democratic services said earlier that corporate scrutiny do want to review this area of work on the 17th of November. So the proposal has gone back that we use that corporate scrutiny session to, to share that action plan in detail and get to the, some of the detail about whether they're... Because they've done it as a traffic lights, so it's whether, as members, you agree with those uh, priorities and that risk assessment, and then we can use that by which to move forward. And hopefully, Cabinet will support the recommendation that this group can be the main discussion repository for that. Um, so then in terms of our tenant consultative group, um, I just want to introduce Sally and Iris who are sitting at the bottom of the room. Um, just to say something about TCG, it is put, our tenant consultative group is a constituted group. They have AGMs, um, officers and members of that committee are nominated and voted on. Um, it's part of the council's reg landlord regulatory framework. Um, and they, they are the umbrella group that supports a lot of other tenant representation through the Complaints Review Panel, um, Tenants Voice, which is the editorial on Open House, um, etc. So all those different working groups report up through to TCG and they follow very carefully the Cabinet Forward Plan so that we can always reflect when we do Cabinet reports on council <coughs> housing that they've been involved. Um, so. I'm not going to embarrass uh, my, our two colleagues, but Irish joined our tenant consultative group from the start in 2008. So she's been there from the outset and got considerable experience in all that. And Sally's a relatively newbie joining in 2017. So Iris has been chair since 2015 and Sally's the current vice chair. Um, Iris is not only the chair of the TCG, but she also sits on the tenant voice the Complaints Review Group, the Tenant Involvement Group, and she's consulted on um, for our Neighbourhood Investment Programme, so she supports that. Sally also is uh, obviously the Vice Chair of TCG, but she's also on Tenants Voice, she's on the Tenant Involvement Group, and she's an active tenant inspector. So she gets involved in all our estate and cleaning inspections and marks our staff, and we use that as feedback. Um, and Iris comes from, uh, lives in the Mercian Ward, and Sally's from Amington. So I just want to thank them both for coming tonight, and we really appreciate. <laughs> Bless you. So, so yes, yeah, so thank you. And and obviously, as we said right at the start, um, 
they are observing tonight and the proposal to cabinet was well, we will with the council's monitoring officer look how we can engage tcg members in this committee going forward so thank you both for that um, and then my final slide you'll be glad to know is then so um, in terms of all that then so what does it mean so the report that goes to cabinet in november um, these may change, um, you know, for all of us who have been involved in cabinet report writing, things emerge and uh, are amended, but there will be a series of recommendations, I suspect. The first one will be around supporting our tenant consultative group colleagues um, and delegating the authority to our monitoring officer to make sure we, we meet the right constitutional and legal requirements for them to operate on this group. Um, so that will be the first one. The next one will be asking Cabinet to approve the self-assessment and the improvement plan um, and suggesting that this is the main committee by which it debates its performance on those areas that have been identified. Um, third one will be around uh, suggesting that corporate, uh, corporate scrutiny's request um, that we use the 17th of November um, to review that improvement plan and agree that that's going to be the final document we take forward, which will probably determine our work plan for the next couple of years. Um, there will then be one around the resourcing plan. We'll then need to commission some work on the HRA business plan around what that means for our choices given the rent cap. Um, we'll also ask them to approve the data submission under the tenant satisfaction measures from ne next year because we need to be getting on and preparing for that. And then also we'll be sharing the response that's gone into government uh, today on the rent cap. So that's it from me, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Um, very uh, clear presentation. Lots of things to take in there. Um, I want to first, uh, I didn't want to do it myself because I knew Tina had a big introduction, but personally, again, thank Sally and Iris for coming along. We had a, a lovely Zoom chat, didn't we, a while ago? Um, so I know all about you and you do great work for the community, so thank you uh, and you're welcome and any of your, any of your colleagues are welcome at any time to come and watch the committee, so thank you. Um, before we open up to questions, I'm very happy that Corporate Scrutiny as well want to invite us along on the 17th of November. It's my uh, my birthday week, so it'll be the best birthday present ever to go and visit that committee. Um, any questions based on what Tina has presented? Thanks. Um, I suppose just kind of a point and then a question. So point, it'd be really helpful in future to get a copy of the presentation. The screens are not fit for purpose. So I know there was a few kind of copies floating around, but it's really difficult to comment on what's in the contents of the presentation when you can't read it. And that's great, but it's lovely, yeah, but you can't, yeah. Um, but I suppose the one thing that I was going to say in terms of the um, rent cap, it obviously is a serious concern for us. <laughs> if that level of money comes out of the budget if that happens i know it's really early in terms of we don't know if it's actually going to happen or not yet one can assume with the cost of living crisis it will happen what is that going to cause in terms of lack of investment etc because well because we're not going to be able to do what we would said we were going to do unless we borrow more so has that kind of happened yet in terms of a decision even though it's very early days thanks Thank you, Councillor Cook. There are some hard copies here for you to take away with you, because I take on board your first point. Yes, thank you for that. Um, in relation to the rent cap, so when we attended the government roundtable uh, last week, um, th the consultation closes today, and their view was that they would let us know by the end of this calendar year what the outcome is going to be. I think all local authorities who were on that call said, well, you know, we're already right in the midst of our budget setting process, we could do with knowing sooner rather than later. Otherwise, it's going to be a number of assumptions and caveats around that. Um, so I think the first thing to say is you're absolutely right. Um, there's been no decision made yet. Um, our feeling was the government appeared, and they've said openly that they are recommending a 5% cap, um, and they appeared to be suggesting how we would uh, implement that rather than them not do it. Um, albeit, from the overwhelming comments that were shared with others that were similar to ours that may change the mind on that we don't know so we have to just bear that in mind but as i've said earlier the um details that will be in the cabinet report and that you can take away with you tonight show that over the next five years it will take seven million 
out of our HRI business plan if that is introduced. We've got a 46.5 million capital programme, so that puts at risk um, our um, ability to continue to make decent homes, our ability to invest in new and affordable housing or acquisitions, our ability to invest in the neighbourhood, um, you know, the neighbourhood renewal plan. Um, but equally, I think what the important thing is, is we wouldn't want to do that unilaterally. Until we know, I think we are taking a cautious approach. If we know, then I think it's going to be about through our tenant consultative group and with yourselves having almost um, a discussion around, well, what are our options? What are we able to do with less? And what does that mean? And where can we? Because our financial consultants have said, you know, you need to raise income or reduce expenditure. Easier said than done. But equally, it comes down to, you know, how can we make it even more efficient? Can we deliver services differently? Can we look at different models? How do we raise income? What does it mean for all our charging? And then we look at what the impact is. But with those numbers, it will mean significant impact. Thanks um, for that. As always, Tina, that kind of really detailed answer. Um, I suppose the other thing as well, I know it's a different work stream, but also picking up what that looks like for the net zero angle as well, because again, there's going to be some significant costs associated with that. So if we can ensure that we're plugging that in, and I know you will, but actually mirroring that and updating members as quickly as possible through yourself or your chair to say actually what does that do as well does that have any impact on that meeting that 2050 absolute worst case scenario and then potentially also the disparity mm -hmm. when we do put things in like ground and air source heat pumps if we can't do as many of the rest of the stock that then starts having an impact on actually some people are paying for significantly less for potentially for energy costs in comparison to others and what does that look like as well i know you can't answer that now but it's it's just something to take into account thank you thank you councillor cook uh, and just before i come to you councillor people i think um it, it is a great concern for me i mean i've read through our um official response to the government um and making the points that tina made earlier for example you know around six in ten of our uh, tenants are in receipt of housing benefits so you know it wouldn't affect them um, but it would affect us uh, and I think it is, and the point you make is quite right about the, the green agenda, Michelle. Um, you know, our decarbonisation fund, for example, one of the um, one of the, the things we have to do is, is match fund. So, you know, what would happen to that if we if we have to prioritise and we can't match fund really important funding projects? So, yeah, it is a worry. Um, we'll hear back from the government hopefully by the end of the year, as Tina said. So, we'll just uh, we'll see what happens for the time being, Councillor People. Thank you. Um, at one point, and I don't know what the figures are at the moment, the HRA was always at a surplus. So I just wondered what the surpluses are looking like at the moment, projected for the future and so on. I'm not suggesting that there'd be a sufficient surplus to meet the, um, the, the likely loss of income, but I just wondered where we, where we stand as, as at now. Thanks. Yes, thank you for that, councillor people. So um, there was a predicted surplus, that's in our current MTFS. What the 3 5 and 7% cap does is have varying degrees of impact on that. Um, in terms of our balances, what it does over 30 years, and again, please take a pack away with you and you can look at this, but assuming it was a 5%, then it means we, instead of having a surplus, there's then a deficit of 69,000 at the end of those 30 years. In terms of over the next five years, which obviously we um, are concerned with in terms of our medium term financial planning, a 5% uh, movement would move us, would, would mean that 6.9 million in terms of, and we would have to make a series of interventions because as you're aware, we cannot have, we cannot plan for a, a deficit within the HRA, that's unlawful. So we would have to intervene in order to prevent that happening. So that's the raw impact. But it, all of those scenarios take those surpluses away. Uh, Councillor Doyle. Thank you. Um, I've been involved um, in similar discussions in my day job uh, because the company I work for has faced similar challenges. Um, first off, 
in terms of the presentation, could have a digital copy rather than a hard copy, please. Uh, secondly, regarding the inspections that are scheduled for every four years, uh, it's good news that you've already brought somebody in from outside to have a look. Um, who were they? Who did you? Um, this is a layered question, so I'll get through the question and then you can answer it. Um, who did you bring in? Uh, what? How often do you intend to bring them in to carry out a self audit or internal audit, I should say? Uh, if you're going to do these internally, then I'd recommend that you bring somebody in from outside of the department rather than somebody inside the department. Uh, one of the roles I did for the company I work for is I was actually an auditor and went round a number of different departments providing an outside view of how they were running their operations. So that's the first question. I'll let you answer that one. Thank you, Councillor Doyle. So um, you're absolutely right. We, In terms of preparing for the self-assessment, we wanted it to be independent um, and therefore we procured it. So we started that sort of from November last year and that procurement process took us up until January when we appointed somebody. Um, we had quite a lot of interest so it was it, we, we drafted a specification it went out on the council's intent system to invite you know suitably qualified contractors to bid for that work um, and we went through an evaluation um, you know I know Alex and the, the tenant consultative group members contributed to that process um, and as I say, there was a lot of interest and we selected a company called Scrutiny and Empowerment and Yvonne Davies and Mick Warner um, are the two lead consultants and they're both former inspectors from what was the Audit Commission um, and, you know, highly skilled in looking for, um, you know, compliance on, on these areas. So they came in, the methodology they undertook was that they met with a full range of stakeholders, so staff focus groups, cabinet colleagues, partners, um, members of the senior team, etc. Um, they did a full data trawl in terms of if we'd said we'd got something, they asked us to provide it. Um, so it was done in that it was it was done to mirror what we would face if we were inspected, and then they presented that report and those findings to us with a draft action plan. So you're absolutely right; it was done, it was done externally. The intention is the improvement plan will probably take us two to three years to deliver. So the view is we wouldn't undertake this annually. There'll probably be an health check that we use through our benchmarking partners annually. But actually, there wouldn't be a need for us to do a full review like this for and to, for, for another three years. Uh, sounds like a good plan and something I'd do myself. Uh, regarding the rent cap, um, the position it puts you in is rather difficult. And I know a company that has faced similar issues. Um, is there a, a continuous improvement plan which you kind of hinted towards uh, or the deployment of tools like Six Sigma to identify potential savings or spend to save? Where could we mitigate or improve things through investment? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Doyle. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely, that sort of total quality management approach in terms of lean um, and efficiency models I think is the next step. I think we need to know the outcome from the government on what the plan is. We then need to commission work on the HRA business plan to know, you know, what our choices are and we engage our tenants in that. And then it's about, so if it's about efficiency, it's about income, which tool is the best to identify that? Um, it's, it's as simple as that. Because I, I agree, you know, the council's already got a transformation agenda around reducing waste. Um, using a variety of different techniques. So, um, you know, that, that will be the next step. Thank you. One final question. Have you identified any champions within the department? You talk about using lean tools and that. Uh, the usual mythology is that you empower the team itself by selecting people uh, for designated training so that they understand these lean tools and that and are able to deploy them and support others in that task. Thank you. Absolutely great question. And again, I think that will come next because I think it's about understanding the problem to which we're trying to find the solution and then how we equip people with the right tools to do that. And certainly the self-assessment regulation legislation proposes that 
I talked earlier about that professional standardisation and an expectation that senior staff are qualified and are trained in these areas. Um, so I would expect so, yeah, I mean, we take that on board and I note that and I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Any other questions? For me, just, just to wrap up and thank you, Tina, for that presentation, I think it's a tale of two halves, isn't it, really? I think what we're doing as a council, the way we're preparing ourselves and self-assessing, always continuing to learn and challenge ourselves, I think is really important and positive. Um, and I thank the team for everything they do um, to constantly try and you know, better what they do each day. Um, and they're doing it to such a good uh, job anyway. Um, and then the, the other half is, of course, something out of our control, which is this proposed rent cap, um, which could cause problems not just to us, but many councils I imagine um, so we wait with bated breath to see what the council, the uh, government say back to us uh, and uh, as soon as we know I'm sure this will be reported back to the, uh, the committee but thank you Tina. Okay we're going to move on now um, to item five which is communications with housing leaseholders and before I hand over to Paul Weston the assistant director assets um, I think I'll just um, overview this with this came from a, a full council meeting um, a, a couple of weeks ago uh, but we were kind of usurped by the uh, Corporate Scrutiny Committee um, who have gone away, discussed this, and then I, I believe, I, I wasn't at the meeting, I was away, but I've uh, listened back to it. They've um, assigned a, a, a working group to go and look into this, which, which is great news. So this will be a verbal update, um, but I don't want to tread on the, on the toes of the uh, Corporate Scrutiny Committee, so I think we'll just have a little verbal update, maybe a discussion now, um, and I very much empower the Corporate Scrutiny Committee to go for it. But over to you, Paul. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, stolen the thunder a little bit on that one because I was going to say, yeah, this has come about as a result of uh, some questions to Council uh, a couple of weeks back and Councillor Farrell at that meeting committed to putting it on the agenda for this committee uh, and also I think, you know, it was then raised through the corporate scrutiny group. Uh, as part of that, the, there is a working group established and certainly a couple of the people in the room are on that group, so presumably you're already aware of that. Uh, I don't know what the format of that will be at the moment, but I think the view was they will look at the communications that have gone out, look at the processes, uh, and then feedback on, on that as to where we are with things. I suppose just to sort of uh, echo something that Tina said earlier, service charges are important to our financial position. Uh, we're spending quite a bit of money on flatted properties where we have leaseholders, and collection of service charges actually is important to maintain our financial position. Uh, so we should be charging those and there is a requirement around that. In terms of the consultation process itself, it's a multi-stage process. It's set out quite, you know, quite clearly in legislation as to what you have to do and at what stages. Uh, there is, unfortunately, a fair gap in the consultation processes in terms of timings. And again, that's just because of the nature of the way they're established. So there was phases of consultation that were done prior to awarding contracts to Equans and Waits, or NG as it was at the time. Uh, and then further down the line, there are further consultations around more specific pieces of work as we progress. And I think it's that sort of final stage of the process is what's, uh, what's sort of raised this issue at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, that's just the way the process is set up and that it's the process we have to follow. What I would say is that throughout that pro throughout the procurement phase and the current phases, we have used external legal advisors to actually produce the I suppose, the document pack for us to ensure that it is a legally compliant process. So we're sort of fairly comfortable that you know it's followed that correct legal process. Uh, for members who aren't aware, I would say we have had this process tested through a first tier tribunal. Uh, there were a group of leaseholders in another area of Tamworth, uh, similar works, roofing works, that took us through a first tier tribunal. Uh, and the view of that tribunal was that no, they were satisfied and for the most part, a couple of areas where that they did raise an issue with us, but nothing significant uh, and effectively found mostly in our favour and there was a slight adjustment on the bill as a result of that. The issues they raised as part of that tribunal were corrected for all future consultation processes. So essentially everything that was issued in the current financial year has addressed those issues that were raised at the tribunal. So again, you know, it is a tested uh, process. So 
and because it's all under the same contract and all under the same consultation process, the same process is applied to all current uh, consultations as applied to the one that was tested through the tribunal process. I think, again, touching on stuff t Tina's mentioned around sort of the regulator, it's likely to be something they consider as part of their sort of review of our financial compliance. Uh, our leases make provision for us to recover charges from leaseholders. So I suspect they will want to see that we're actually following that process through properly uh, and are recovering monies that are due to us under the terms of those leases, particularly if we're sort of saying, you know, the impact on the housing revenue account uh, through rent caps and everything else could be quite significant an impact on our investment programmes. It would be remiss of us to not recover monies that are due to us uh, that potentially further impact on that financial position. Ultimately, if we don't collect service charges that are owed to us, it's the housing revenue account and therefore tenants who are subsidising those costs. Uh, and I think it's important to recognise that because ultimately, for every every you know every five thousand pound we don't collect, for example, that's a kitchen we're not fitting for someone. So it's you know there is a, there is a, an impact down the line, and it would be that the HRA budget that impacts on that one. We do have an obligation to leaseholders in terms of the upkeep of property that's set out clearly in their lease, uh, and that places an obligation on us. And we also have a, an obligation to council tenants in those blocks. I think again, bear in mind, in the vast majority of our blocks where we have leaseholders, we also have council tenants that we have certain statutory obligations to around upkeep and maintenance of those properties. Our view has always been it's better to replace on a planned basis than a reactive basis. Uh, I'd rather be replacing a roof now in a planned way than having a call to say the roof's now failed and we've now got 10, 20, 30 residents that are no longer able to stay in those properties and that we have to move them out while we do emergency repairs. It ends up being more expensive, it's inconvenient, and it's quite embarrassing to sort of, you know, have to sort of say, we're moving lots of people out of a property because we didn't repair it when we knew it needed it. So really, I suppose that's where we are with it. Obviously, there is the working group now set up through uh, the scrutiny committee, and clearly we'll cooperate with that group in terms of providing the information and supporting through the process. I'm not sure at the moment what the feedback processes from that group. I presume it will be feedback to corporate scrutiny, but then I'm not sure where it will go from there because I'm not sure what the, the terms of reference are for that group yet because it was only established it last week, I think it was agreed. So not seen the terms of reference for that group yet. So presumably that will follow through and uh, I would like to think it will come back to this committee just as an information, uh, but I would assume then there might be reports through the cabinet process and possibly even back to full council, depending on what the potential impacts of that are. So, so that, that was sort of where we are at the moment with it. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, just to reiterate, I, I think it would be um, unusual for two committees to be discussing the same thing at the same time, but uh, as it's on the agenda, any questions or comments? Michelle? I suppose as I was the one that moved it to go to corporate, that probably is a good point to comment. Um, yeah, I think it's it's right that it kind of goes into corporate, but it's good to see that this committee is looking, especially at some point in the future, when kind of the tenant consultative committee members are able to comment as well. Even though this is leaseholders, I think general communications, and Paul, Tina, you know from when I was a cabinet member, it was something that I was always kind of commenting on in terms of how we inform people of what what's happening and when and um, so i think that's kind of potentially a wider piece rather than just leaseholders that i definitely like to see picked up as part of this process because it's a it's an ever evolving um topic that we need to kind of keep on top of um but yeah note entirely what you say about kind of someone has to pay um at some point so yeah but i would assume it would go back to full council because it would go working group back to corporate scrutiny and then I would assume that it would then go back to full council um, as a recommendation, assuming there are recommendations. Thank you.
Thank you. And before uh, move on to councillor people, uh, you know, I think you're probably right. Um, it probably will end up in full council, and myself and I'm, I'm sure Paul and anyone else is very happy to to come and have the conversation. You know, there's a, a lot of our time recently, and quite rightly, it's been taken up by this leaseholder issue. We, we take it very seriously, um, and uh, you know, we we understand both sides of the, the story, and it, it is a difficult one for us, the council. Um, but I think it's right that it's scrutinised away from here, um, councillor people. Thanks, Chair. I don't really have anything much to add to what you've said. I think it is a very important issue, which has clearly caused a great deal of distress for a number of um, residents. So I think it's important that it gets a thorough airing um, so that we can see whether anything has gone wrong and if it has, what we need to do in future. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? Anyone else? OK, great. Paul? Yeah, Chair, thank you for that. One thing I would want to raise is I'm aware that there's been a lot of communications outside of the Council on this subject. Uh, I'm also aware that that has possibly caused more upset than we would have liked with people who aren't actually even on our programmes for work, who, as a result of that ex, ex parte communication, shall we say, believe they are now on the programmes for work. Uh, so I think, you know, the message we're trying to get across to people now is if you haven't had a letter from us, it's almost certainly because you're not on the on the programmes for that work. Uh, we've communicated that through our customer services teams uh, and anyone who's calling in, particularly as a result of obviously it being in the media, they are, they are aware now which properties are included and which aren't. It doesn't affect our tenants because there's a whole separate piece of communication with our tenants that's more about how we're doing it and that type of stuff it's more the i suppose the softer communications because our tenants aren't paying direct but those leaseholders who are directly affected will have had letters if they haven't had letters it's almost certainly they're not affected by it but if you have got any sort of uh, constituents that you know about are a bit concerned if they contact us we can at least give them that information and say yes you are or no you're not affected by it because i am just aware that there has there's been a number of people contact us uh, including private homeowners who somehow have got this impression that you know we're, we're going to come and replace all the roofs in a certain area that's clearly not the case but you know unfortunately that's because those communications haven't come from us we've only communicated with those people who are having work we don't normally and wouldn't normally communicate with anyone who's not having work because you know that that could be well out of our own households probably five thousand people uh, if you write to the whole of tamworth to say you're not having work it could be significantly more than that so i think it's just important to get that across and you know if people do have any concerns phone and ask because we can at least tell you whether you are or not included in that thank you chair yeah, that's a very good point, actually. I think that the whole issue of communications around this comes from that because lots of people say, I've not been communicated with, but it's because nothing's happening to your roofs. So, yes, uh, it's a really good point. Uh, any other comments? Councillor Cook. Thanks. Just to kind of come back on that, I mean, at the, a meeting that I was at with some of the leaseholders um, a couple of weeks ago in um, a local pub, there was about 30 of them in the room, and halfway through, a couple of ladies were like, oh, does this affect us because we're council tenants? <laughs> so again, it is quite clear that people talk, neighbours talk, they don't, people don't know who's included, but also that other kind of issue where people who are leaseholders that haven't had letters are saying, it might not be my roof now, but what's coming up down the line? And I think that's another point of actually giving people a, enough notice when we can, obviously once we write out formally, that's a really, kind of clear indication something's coming but also giving people a really clear understanding of what else is may or may not be coming down the line because I think people are thinking hang on if we, if this happens now then and I don't take part and I don't get involved what else is coming and it might be nothing to do with roofs in a particular area it might be to do with guttering in a certain it could be anything and I think that's just something that another part of this is actually how do we communicate to people what are they expecting as a leaseholder? What are you expecting? Even though you should know it through your conveyancing system, what are you actually responsible for? And is there anything at all in our work streams much, much earlier where we can that this may be something? Because until we write formally and say we're doing it, then it's not certain, but just from a general understanding. But 
completely agree. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Cook. It's something we're working on uh, as a team is um, a more forward plan style kind of schedule of works um, for leaseholders. So that's something in the process, isn't it, Paul? But thank you. Do you want to? Yeah, please do. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose very quickly on that one in terms of the conveyancing stuff, one of the issues with that is we don't know when people are selling properties because we don't need to know if 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 it's an onward transfer of property then we're not necessarily involved in that process beyond filling in the standard legal questionnaire so the lpe one forms uh, those come to us we complete those and put all the details we should put on those but it's actually for the conveyancing firm or the solicitor to explain that to their client we don't have any sort of contact or interaction through the sales process because that's not for us to do our, our contact is with the solicitors and really they should be conveying that information because presumably most of these people are paying not insignificant sums of money to their solicitors for that service so that's sort of i suppose the the, the process we go through with it because we just don't have that contact with people Um, yes, I'm, I'm just slightly confused by that comment, so really asking for clarification. When um, an individual purchases their, their lease from the council, then obviously we, we have contact with them. So um, I, I'm not I, I didn't quite understand whether you were talking about if they then sell on obviously then you, you won't have contact with them but at the initial stage we do so there may i don't know because we haven't looked at this yet but there may be something there about how do we communicate what's particularly um unique about having the council as a landlord and how do we make sure that people are very clear about what their responsibilities might be in the future thanks chair yeah thank you chair uh no council people the reality of it is it's all done through the conveyancing process so when a person comes through the right to buy process there are standard forms that come through to us to complete we complete those and send them back to their solicitor or conveyancer and it's for their conveyancer to explain to them what that lease actually says so there's a standard lease that we use that's sort of fairly standardized across all of our properties that goes to their solicitor as part of the process we explain within the forms that we send back to their solicitor what's what the lease is so they get a copy of that any known works at the point of where we're selling the property uh things like uh insurance and ground rents all of that goes in that pack their solicitor explains that to them because we're not we're not in a position to actually say to them this is your uh legal legal status that's that's what the conveyancing process is there for because the solicitor is representing their interests for the legal process so we supply all that to their solicitor and we have to supply that but we don't communicate that direct to sort of buyers because that's the that's the process that the solicitor goes through As you're probably aware, I started life as a conveyancing solicitor, so I do know. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess what I was really saying was, and we haven't looked at this yet, so we don't know, there might be scope for us as a council to do a little bit extra. So normally, you're absolutely right, it's up to the solicitor who's acting for the buyers to make sure that he or she's happy with everything that's being presented. But because there is a particular legal position with regard to um, the situation that we've got here, where you've got um, council tenants and effectively non-council tenants sharing a roof, then there might be something else that we could do that would just help them in the future. That's, that's really all I was saying. But as I say, we haven't we haven't looked into this process yet, so we, we can't really comment. And it'll be something that'll be interesting to see. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, no, thank you, Chair. No, thanks, thanks, Council people. Yeah, absolutely. Take on board what you're saying. I mean, clearly, anything we do, we would need to run through a legal process just to make sure that we're not doing anything that could ultimately impact negatively on the legal process, because what we don't want to be doing is being seen to, I suppose, give legal advice when it's not our position to give legal advice. But yeah, I mean, ultimately, not a problem. I think, unfortunately, having been to a couple of uh, seminars given by legal firms, 
Uh, I think they actually recognise themselves that they don't always perform as well as they could do when they're dealing with leasehold conveyancing uh, in explaining to leaseholders what their obligations are. And I think that's recognised in the sector. And I suppose it's something really they need to be addressing within the sector. Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll happily provide any information that's asked of us uh, and you know, we'll support as much as we can. And, but like I say, I think within the legal confines. Michelle? No? Um, so, yeah, so but just to quick come back on that, I promise it's my final point. Um, just, I mean, I think in terms of that kind of conveyancing documentation that gets sent to us as effectively the leaseholder for us to kind of complete on behalf, there's at least one instance that I've seen from what I've seen from the, the residents' group that there was actually one bit where it said, is there any section 20, is it section 20 to section 20, isn't it, works during the next two years. And it was literally only about six months later that they got the notification, and but we tipped non-applicable on our form that had gone back. So again, it's those sorts of things. And that's just an example, and that'll come through the working group. But I think just in the meantime, anything we are sending back, if we can be really, really clear that that is happening, and I completely agree with Council of People, when we're sending stuff back, could there be even a, a little leaflet that goes back with that document and say, this is the extra standard that you're going to have as a, effectively as under the council umbrella, because we are not in the position that we can go and kind of get Bob the Builder, so to speak, to come in and do your, your works. Whereas me as a leasehold property owner with the kind of the freehold might be able to go, well, actually, I'll go for the cheapest quote and it doesn't matter because I'm not as responsible in the same way as the standard. So I think it's just something to look at. But yeah, looking forward to kind of inviting, well, working with the group to invite people in and actually to get to the bottom of this for the benefit of everybody ultimately. But so, thank you in advance. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. That's an interesting discussion and I look forward to hearing more from the Corporate Scrutiny Committee. Great. Um, we now move on to uh, item six, which is the exclusion of the press and public. Um, I propose that in accordance with the provisions of the local authorities' executive arrangements, meetings and access to information, England Regulations 2012, etc., uh, and Section 100A4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the present public be excluded from this meeting during the consideration of the following business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of Schedule 12A to the Act, and the public interest in withholding the information outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information to the public. Do I have a second there? Thank you, Councillor People. Thank you very much. Um, can we uh, turn the cameras off? Thank you very much. Are we all in favour of that? Good. <laughs>